Hello and welcome to this LUSAS online event. Your presenters today are myself, Philip Ike, and my colleague, Steve Rhodes. We're talking to you today about why we built LUSAS 16 and what it means for you as engineers. And that has three main thrusts. One is the simplification of the interface to make it easier to use and more efficient for you. The second is enhanced collaboration that makes it easier for teams to work together whether they're in LUSAS or whether they're sharing cross-discipline using industry standard formats and platforms uh, according to BIM standards. We've also improved our design capability and extended the workflow for the engineer out of analysis into comprehensive steel design and a greater capability in concrete. So today's presentation is going to focus mainly on the simplification of the workflow for the engineer using this new version. This adds to existing information that you can find on our website. If you want a more general impression of the product, there's a video hosted there at lusas.com. We value your interaction during the event and encourage you to do so. Please enter any questions into the webinar panel and we'll come back to you with answers later in the event. So what does LUSAS 16 mean? We want it to be faster, more efficient and friendlier in order that you as engineers apply it to a greater variety of your infrastructure problems. In order to do that, we've streamlined the interface, removed clutter, made it easier for you to concentrate on production. We've given you new tools to make results easier to understand with greater clarity. We've extended the workflow out of analysis into design tools for steel and concrete and we've enhanced the report writer to make it easier to generate the report in exactly the format you want according to templates and to easily create revisions whenever a project changes. So part of streamlining the interface is understanding what type of analysis you're going to do to start with. So whether you're doing a two-dimensional grillage, a two-dimensional structure, a three-dimensional structure, or an axis symmetric, LUSAS will adapt the interface to suit and reduce the clutter that the engineer has to deal with. In presenting results, we've enhanced this, so using the results locations, you can now get any result you want at any location on the structure, but that location is fixed. Any change to the model, you can easily report the information out at that same point. Averaging has been improved. It's now smarter and uh, easier to use. Slicing is quicker. The viewing is easier as it gets superimposed directly onto your model view. And all of this information you can now combine directly with a report. And any changes to the model, you can regenerate that information directly, updating the report, all the information on screen. As extending the workflow, we've got new tools for comprehensive steel design. This allows the engineer to design to a variety of codes of practice and to produce a detailed summary report, allowing him to see every step, every clause, every derivation in the calculation, making it easy to share with checkers and clients alike. The steel designer will be subject to a further webinar in this presentation, we'll be concentrating on concrete. For reporting, you can now put everything in your report. That comprehensive report, including input information, output information, textual and graphical information, is far easier to, for the checker or client to understand, can be put into a variety of formats that may relate to the uh, project standards that they're working to. Any change you need to make to the model the report can be updated instantaneously. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Steve and he can take you through the product in action. Okay, thank you, Philip. I'd like to add my welcome to you as well. You should now be seeing the Lucis version 16 interface with this curved girder bridge on the screen. If you're familiar with the Lucis interface already, you'll notice a few updates um, straight away. The panels, that can slide away. And as I hover, they reappear, as you can see here. And you can also 
pin them to retain them on the side of your screen. That just gives you a little bit more modeling space if you like. We've got all the usual tools for drawing points and lines, um, geometry, rotating and zooming, panning and all those things. Um, and we've now got this option, which is switched on, as you can see, for true perspective view. And this is in fact a full 3D model with shell elements representing the deck and the webs with beam elements representing flanges and stiffeners, bracing and so on. So it's a mixed shell and beam approach. And you can see if I drag my uh, one of my saved views across the transverse moments there in the Dex Lab. But I can also quickly and easily see the composite moments, um, the sliced moments. That's part of a big overhaul of the old slice resultants tool. And these will now appear on my model as a diagram, as you can see here. So I can see uh, the, the bending moments very quickly. So that may be something you wish to explore if you're doing bridges or structures where you want that kind of output. I'm going to show you how to create a bridge deck model, something simpler than this one, showing the whole workflow in overview, if we could have the PowerPoint back for a moment. So in this example, I'd like to create a simple deck model using plate elements, view some results, generate a report, show you how to make some corrections or modifications to the model, the traffic load optimizer, and carrying out some reinforcement checks. And here's the deck concerned. It's 32 foot wide and one foot eight thick. It has main reinforcement of number six bars at six inch centers. The carriageway over there is a total of 25 foot between curb lines. There are three spans there. There's 48, uh, 64 and 48 foot. And because these are continuous over simple support, so it's not integral, we're going to analyze the deck alone rather than the whole structure. Of course, in Lucis, you have the flexibility to model the whole structure when you feel that's the best or the right option, uh, which perhaps it would be for uh, an integral bridge. But on plan, this deck has a skew of about 35 degrees. So if I go back to Lucis now and I start a new model, I give that a name, skew slab deck. And I choose now an analysis category. And those are the four categories which Philip spoke about just now. Um, so I'm going to choose a 2D grillage or plate model. In fact, this is going to be a plate model rather than a 3D model. I can change my mind downstream, of course, but this option um, streamlines the choices I make and uh, avoids me getting muddled about which options are valid. I've got model units there of kip, feet, killer slug. Uh, seconds and Fahrenheit and here I can also choose a startup template. I'm not going to use one today I'm going to start with just a fresh clean empty model as we get into the modeling here. The first thing I'm going to do here is completely optional um, and it's just to show you the new layout grid facility. If I go to utilities and choose layout grid I can choose to have a layout grid which is rectangular circular maybe even skewed which perhaps would be useful for this model but just to give you a quick demonstration of it I'm going to um, just run through here and put in a 16 foot grid and that's going to help me rapidly generate the surfaces that I want for this particular model. I can have as many layout grids as I wish um, in this case I just need the one in fact that's as long as I need it for. I, I, I don't have to keep it visible even if I have used it for what I want to do. So I've generated those three slabs very rapidly. And that is the geometry of my model. And traditionally then we need to give more information to the model about what exactly we're analysing, what it's made out of on those things. So that's on the attributes menu in Lucis. Um, and I need to work down these until I reach this line which tells me I have all of the attributes which are absolutely required for a linear static analysis. So I start at the top work down, starting with a mesh attributes which defines elements. Um, and I'm going to choose a mesh for those surfaces. And those of you familiar with the system will recognize this dialogue and we'll see that the list there is now very, very short um, because those, uh, those thick plates and thin plates are the only valid um, element types for a 2D model. So I can use plate elements in my 2D model and when I press OK, that appears as a little icon over on the left hand side and I can choose which surfaces, in fact in this model all of the surfaces, which surfaces and uh, those are now assigned when I drag and drop the attribute. You can see I've now got a default 4x4 element mesh 
And if I don't want that, I can change that in the surface attribute. I can change the element size, or I can go to the attributes mesh and line option. Here I do see the valid element types for lines. Again, a very, very short list where I can have a grillage element or I can have a joint element. Apart from that, I might choose to have no element and then I can choose an element length. So I might say that I should have an element length of six foot. Um, and if you're not sure, you can always check the units there and you can use the unit converter if you want to use the unit converter. Any time you see uh, a numerical input in Lucis, that unit converter is always available. So I could say this is my six foot divisions. And again, I choose where exactly that applies in my model. So that might apply here to all the lines in my model. And as I drag and drop that, you see the mesh is updated to a six foot square grid. But of course, this isn't actually the geometry of my model. Um, I need to introduce the skew, and I'm going to do that by moving that line. And you can change the geometry, the shape of your model, at any point during the modeling process, simply by going in there and making that change. So I'm going to move 22 foot and uh, 5 inches. And I OK that. So I've got that skew, as you can see. Working then on down the list, I can choose my geometric properties. If I were to use a section library, I'd see a whole bunch of different uh, sections. But in this case, all I need is a surface thickness. So I'm going to put in a surface thickness of 1 foot 8 inches. Again, remember that unit converter is there anytime you need it. Um, so I'll give that the name, thickness. And again, I will assign that to all the surfaces in my model just by dragging and dropping. If I rotate that around, you'll see that actually that's been drawn actually to scale. But of course, that's not terribly useful in this case because it's just all one thickness. Um, so I might turn that fleshing off and I just keep on working down. It just enables me to see those points and lines a little bit more clearly. Working down there, the material uh, library is my next stop. And I might choose concrete. Um, apologies to those of you watching from uh, Canada. Um, we do have the Canadian codes in here as well. Um, here's uh, the USA code, the Ashdo code, and I can choose a grade. I could use um, the advanced define. Uh, for those of you watching Canada, I should mention there was uh, an earlier webinar, which would be in SI units, which perhaps you can watch that uh, if, you, if you'd really rather watch in SI units, uh, although that would be to the Euro code. In the advanced define here, I can... Um, enter a compressive strength and a weight and so on and have um, Lucis calculate the relative properties or I can just choose a specific grade let's use a 5 KSI grade concrete and then assign that to my model in the same way again dragging and dropping from the tree view on the left to the working model pane on the right. Coming now to my supports again I only need one fixity because I'm in a 2D model it's a, a Z direction translation which I've fixed and I can call that my bearings. And if I OK that, again, I choose where that applies in my model to these four lines, drag and drop. I can see little green arrows indicating where the supports are now in my model. And finally, working down the attributes menu and getting to the loading. There are a whole range of loading options here, which uh, I'm not going to go into. Uh, but let's just choose a simple one, a global distributed load. And I'm going to have a global distributed load per unit area. And in this case, I'm going to base that on some surfacing. So I might have surfacing, which is sort of three inches thick, say a quarter of, an in, a, quarter of a foot, that would be, and um, 0.14 kips per cubic foot. That's coming out of the Ashto table uh, 351-1. Um, and anytime you see a numerical input in Lucis, again, you can type in an expression. Saves you getting a calculator out. I give that a name like surfacing and press finish. It appears over there in the tree view. And again, I can choose where it applies. In this case, the whole model again. And I can put it into a new load case. Let's make it my surfacing load case. You can see those little blue arrows. And in fact, now if I look at the analysis tab of the tree view, I've got two load cases. The second one is my surfacing. The first one might be my dead weight. And I can right click here and choose to add gravity to that load case. Now I've done everything that I need for a linear static analysis, so it only remains to press the solve button. And Lucis will go away, make the calculations, and I can now see that I have some results. I can see straight away that I have a, uh, a deformation there. And when I drag and drop my low case, I will switch between the low cases. And I can add some other results that are of interest to me, so maybe a contour. 
have a contour of forces and moments that could be shear forces or whatever in this case i'm going to look at the moments in the global x direction that's the the direction that would give me the x direction reinforcement okay that and maybe if i just drag around there we go that's a, a nice sort of plan view zooming a little bit there um and i could save that view if that's what i want to do um and move it to how i like it and press save view and give it a name my plan view and now i'd like to show you another function which uh, philip mentioned in his presentation that's the graphing tool which has been much improved if i go through the uh, utilities menu and find the graph through 2d i can snap to a grid size or i can use a selected line let's just snap to a six foot grid and if i drag across there i'm just drawing a line through my model which is where i want to graph uh, some quantity like my uh, perhaps my bending moment here. I can choose to have that for the, the single low case or for specified low cases. I'm going to have it for all of my low cases and I can choose whether that's going to be for the whole of my model or maybe some group. Um, I'm going to just use the visible part of my model for that now um, and I can choose to, to graph any results quantity. In this case I'm going to pick the uh, MX moments just like I have on the screen at the moment. And here I can specify a width, an averaging width, if you like, a corridor width, so that I don't just get nodal results, I get results that are averaged over, a, say, a three foot width. When I press finish, I can see the graph, as I expect, showing me positive and negative moments for those two low cases. And if I just close that a moment, you can see it's stored here on the tree view, I can regenerate it any time. I can also uh, I can make as many graphs as I like, but I can also display using the diagrams layer. The diagrams layer now allows me to choose forces and moments for the thick plate and to choose any force or moment for the thick plate um, at the, and display them at the graph locations. So when I do that, you'll see a, a graph appears. Um, in fact, it's a bending moment diagram effectively. Um, as I rotate it around, you can see the numbers perhaps a little bit more clearly. I can obviously change the colors of those if I wish. And I can say, well, let's save that view and call it my 3D view. The great thing about saving those views is it's very easy to switch between them just by dragging and dropping without having to change lots of different options. And of course, with the ability to drag and drop my load cases, likewise, I can easily see the different results that I want to see. Now that I've created several saved views and a graph, I might also want some tabular results. So I can go to the print results wizard. This has been updated in version 16. And you can see that I've got a choice of load cases, or again, I can choose all load cases. And I can choose any of these results quantities. So I might have tables of displacement at every node, or perhaps more usefully, reactions. I'm going to choose the reactions. I can see the table and have a summary as well. When I give that a name and I press OK, it both appears over there in the tree view uh, as, a, as an icon. And also, I've got all the results here generated for the different load cases, both the full results and the summary results. And I can right click, save them to Excel or press the save button up there. When I close that, any time I want to see those results again, I can right click and regenerate them from the tree view. The great thing about that is as I change the model, if I make any change to the model, um, they will be regenerated fresh. And this is where the reporting function comes in. Once you've perhaps generated various different things that are of interest to you, you can make a new report. That might be a report for your checker or for your uh, client. And here I'm going to use the same units. I could change the units. I'm going to put a particular view on my plan view there my uh, on my front page. And this option allows me to eliminate white space between chapters, if that's what I'd like to do. Save a bit of paper. I can have a a name for that report and when I right click I can add chapters to it so what's going to be included in my report could be uh, some point coordinates I could include the material properties any of these input quantities all of the input quantities if I like um, and I can include report results so I've got here listed already the tabular results which I um, have previously requested the reactions but I also can add more uh, displacements or whatever other results I might be interested in a table format there Likewise, on the graph tab, I can include the graphs that I previously created. And on the saved view tabs, I can choose to include one or all or several of my uh, saved views, including them for this low case, the active low case, or perhaps all low cases. So I can again choose that. 
Finally, I've got the notes tab, which allows me to choose uh, to create a note if I wish. I don't have any in my model or to include any that are already in my model. Um, and there may be something I want to say about the element selection or element sizes, which I can type in here. And I can just call this uh, notes about meshing. And this will be stored within the model, included in my report, and it will never be separated from my model, which means that um, if I pass this model or this report on to anyone else, they'll be able to read my own notes about how the model came to be exactly what it is. And here, if I view the report, all that information, Lucid will now compile the tabular results and the graphical results, the graph and so on, into a PDF a quicker than I can describe to you what it's doing. And if you scroll on through here, you can obviously see the tables of data which I've requested and the different uh, contour plots and tables of results at the end there that I requested as well. About now, I probably noticed that I made some error in my model. Um, I hope you don't make this kind of error yourself, um, but here I've actually done the skew in the wrong direction. So I want to move that line. I'm going to move it um, times 22 foot 5. So if I move it 2 times 22 foot and 5 in the x direction, I'm now going to get uh, my, uh, well, all of my results have been invalidated by that change. And so if I press the solve button, Lucis will go and regenerate all of the stresses, uh, deflections, whatever results I've requested. And if I want to see my report, well, I can just view it again. When I view that report, Lucis is now compiling all the revised results. And so everything I look at in this PDF will be the revised model. So I can see straight away uh, that I've got the skew now in the other direction. And indeed, all of the results in my model are corrected. So I'd like to show you... Uh, a couple more things before we move on to the traffic load optimizer. Um, the first is um, the new model merge function. If you go to the file menu, you'll see the model merge option there. Along with all the import and export options here, uh, you can see that there's a, a BIM, BRIM, a IFC import export function uh, available. But I'm using the model merge. Um, although this isn't necessarily a particularly good example of model merge, this is just bringing in some curb lines to define the carriageway, which is where the traffic loading can go. Um, of course, you could bring in any um, model and add it to the model which is currently on the screen. So I'm just importing those curb lines. Once they're imported, you can see those pink lines that have appeared on the screen. Along with that come any attributes which are included in that merged model and um, indeed low cases here, so I don't need these low cases, but um, in other situations that might be a very useful function. Along with that, I wanted to show you what happens when um, in the course of making your model, you perhaps make uh, a little slip, a little error. So if I just reset the results there and pick uh, this surface, as I pick that surface, um, what I'm going to do is remove from it a material property. I'm going to deassign um, from that selection my material. And that's just the sort of thing which may happen. And if you don't have a chance to check it, you may just find um, that there's an error in your model. And when you press the solve button um, and we save that model, when we solve that model, we get a message like this that says one or more errors has occurred please refer to the text window. So if I look down in the text window, I can see that it says here, surface two has no material or composite properties assigned. Now, we of course know where surface two is in this model, but if you have a, uh, a model which may have thousands of surfaces in it, um, then it may not be so easy to identify the location with whatever error um, you've received. So if I just double click on that message, you'll see I get this identify object dialog box. And it allows me to say, well, the, the message refers to plane of surface two. What would I like to do? I'd like to clear the, the existing selection, select that surface, pan so the surface is in the center of the screen and show an indication. This ought to tell me exactly where that surface is. So you can see immediately where the surface is and then I can rectify that problem by dragging and dropping the material property. That ability to identify your error um, and correct it quickly is, I think, very, very valuable. Now when I press the solve button, I should get some new results. 
And perhaps at this stage, I should be thinking about moving on to look at the influences in the model and the um, traffic load patterns, which would give me the most onerous effects. So I'm going to go to the attributes menu and define some influences. Um, I'm going to use the direct method and choose an entity being the forces of moments. So again, I could be looking at shear forces or moments here. I'm going to look at moments, uh, global moments, much like the ones that we've been investigating so far for this model. And if I just assign that in this sort of sagging area in the negative region and there in the sagging area of the main span as well, and I can drag and drop the moment uh, influence. And when I OK that, I see little blue arrows indicating the locations of those influences. And I can now select the curb lines as well and get Lucas to calculate the traffic load patterns for the code of practice of interest. If I go to the bridge menu, I can use vehicle load optimization. Here's a whole range of countries. Um, indeed, we've got Canada there again, um, and down at the bottom here, the United States of America. If I choose the United States, you can see we have um, a lot of state implementations. So um, someone asked me about this the other day. Um, have we really gone and read all the state manuals? Um, well, yes, we have. <laughs> We've checked if there are any particular um, requirements for those manuals. You can see some of them, Louisiana there appears several times because we've read the updated manual over and over. Um, and again here, let's look at Florida, for example, it says January 2014 to January 2017. That means uh, we've, we've seen those alterations, if there were any, between 14 and 17 and taken them into account. Um, in that case, they must have been identical. And so they share one item on this list. Let's look at the Florida options in here. I can choose to have my patterns including global factors because when you place the HL93 load, um, you will have different factors for all those uh, different uh, combination cases. Or I can just have the patterns without any global factors. I'm going to choose that in this case. I'm going to stick with just the notional design load and I'm going to combine with dead loads later. I'm going to add in the load factors on my dead loads, my temperature loads, my traffic loads later on in the process. So I can OK that. I can view the onerous effects table. That just gives me three results, really, or uh, those locations of interest. Um, but perhaps I'm going to say that I want to see the traffic load patterns today because that's an interesting thing to actually see and to be able to check. I can define the carriageways from the, uh, the curbs that I imported and I can set which influences I wish to include. In this case, I want to include all of them. And I'm going to look at those over the pier um, with a alternative pattern that is uh, allowing two uh, trucks or two tandem uh, as appropriate to the code. When I OK that, Lucis will run the influence analysis, in this case just for three influences, but I can include as many influences as I would require. And then the traffic load optimizer runs, and quicker than I can tell you what it's done, it's actually worked out well. There's the the width of the carriageway there, what do we say, it was 25 foot. So the 25 foot carriageway, um, it means I can have two lanes of 12 foot and then one lane of one foot. And within each lane of 12 feet, I can have um, a 10 foot uh, truck load, if you like. So if I drag and drop that, uh, we can see the loading. And you can see the loading there has been shunted over, the 10 foot load has been shunted over to one side. You can see the little red arrows indicating the tandem in, in lane one by the looks of things, which is close to this location of interest and the uh, design truck in the far lane, again pushed over to the, uh, I suppose the south side, if you like, of the bridge. And a larger area on this side because there's one foot spare. So my two 12, uh, my two 12 meter lanes have been shunted over. In this case now, over to this side, I've got a truck and it's a uh, truck, sorry, in lane two and a tandem in, in the lane nearest to the location of interest. So you can see very clearly the different load cases which are generated in order to give me the maximum moments. In order to actually see um, the results across the structure, I press the solve button again. And now I'm looking at the bending moments under that specific load case. And that's all very well, but I wish to combine that now with the dead loads and other loads that there may be in my model. Obviously in a real design you'd include um, a whole load of other loading cases which I haven't uh, done in this example. 
But I can go to the design menu and use the new design combinations option. That's also on the analysis menu, along with the basic combination, the smart combination and enveloping functions, which pe people are probably familiar with. But using the design combination brings me in, again, I can choose the Canadian code, Euro code, uh, Chinese code, or indeed the Ashdo code here. And I can then classify with a type each of my load cases. So my dead load is a, uh, a DC, my wearing course there, the surfacing, DW, and then I also have my notional live loads. There we go. Several of those. And of course, each of those patterns are mutually exclusive. They can't all occur at the same time. Um, so when I come onto this next page of the uh, wizard, I can choose whether I'm creating combinations for the deformations, for the other effects, or for both. I'll just use other effects in this case. And I can choose whether I want all of the strength classes, just one of the strength classes, whatever else, um, and servicing and so on. On the advanced button, I can see exactly what factors have been applied. Uh, and those may indeed be modified from the Ashdo, uh, if you wish. And I can go in here to choose, let's say, the variable actions. And I can, in either case, choose whether these loads are mutually exclusive or whether they, uh, they add. Um, and in this case, I want to say that these are uh, these traffic loads are, in fact, mutually exclusive. The, the notional loads are mutually exclusive, so they don't occur at the same time. I can create a basic combination or smart combinations. I'm going to stick with a basic combination. When I press Finish, what you'll see occurring is that I get a list of all these many strength one cases and strength two cases and strength three cases. Each of these combinations includes um, several of the uh, load cases with the appropriate factors. And we can see them all listed here. We've tested here every load case that's included in every permutation that should be checked and with every load factor for the strength one case. If I drag and drop, um, the last combination there, we can see the kind of results that we're getting. And we also have the envelope here, which allows us to see what are the worst load effects from all of those combinations that have been defined. But before we look at that, let's move on a little to see how we could use the reinforced concrete slab designer in this instance. So here, I go to the attributes menu, and I can go to the design option, I see the RC slab design there. When I go into that option, I can choose my bar sizes to be uh, USA standards, and I can see that I've got number six bar at six inches, so that might be fine for my main span. But then maybe in the uh, side spans, I've got a slightly smaller bar size. Let's call it a side span. There you go. I've now created those two attributes, and if I pick the main span and drag and drop that, that's assigned to that one surface. These side spans assigned to those two locations. I can now go to the design menu and choose the RC slab design option. And again, you can see I've got a range of different uh, locations or countries that I can use, regions in, including Canada again. And if I go to the United States and choose LRFD, I can then choose to have my ULS design using the bending effects only or using bending and in-plane effects if I have a 3D model. So in this 2D model, I can't include any in-plane effects, but in a 3D model, I would see that second option available. That's something that's new in version 16. Here, I can also make some specifications about the yield stress and so on. And when I press the finish, I get a one-off message. I can switch this message off. And this message is telling me the slab design results in version 16 now come in just like any other contour, which makes life uh, very straightforward. I'm already looking at a contour, so I can edit that contour and choose instead of seeing the forces and moments to see the slab design results from Ashdo. So here I can choose to look at my uh, utilization in the top or in the bottom face. Let's look at the, the bottom face, for example, here. And you can see that I'm getting a large Overutilization there, 1.86 factor, that means 186% utilized. So the, the steel which I specified was not sufficient in that area. And that's unfortunately not, not as bad as it gets. It gets worse um, because here I have the, uh, that's just one particular load case. Here I have the envelope. When I drag and drop that to set it active, I can 
Now, get Lucis to calculate for every node in this model, using every load combination that's listed here, the worst utilization for the top or the bottom face, um, and display that um, based on the, uh, the load cases already defined. So the reinforced concrete designer, um, we can't show them the deformed mesh anymore, we can only show the reinforcement, but you can see now I'm getting in this area um, a 213% over utilization, which means I do need to, in fact, go in to the uh, the attributes here and change the bar sizes or the um, spacing. Or perhaps I could go to the contours layer here and I could ask for a contour of the area of steel in the X direction, which would give me an idea what sort of steel I should be using. Or obviously the Y and the uh, the top and the bottom faces can also be investigated there. I can add any of the contour plots or uh, tabulated results that I wish to to my report and then generate more reports. But that really completes what I wanted to show you um, just as a quick overview of how you get from end to end in the modelling of a bridge structure using Lucis version 16. I hope you found that useful um, and I'll hand you back now to Philip. Thank you very much, Steve. We're going to take a pause at that point to respond to some questions. Uh, one question that we've had repeated in a variety of different ways is, what are you going to tell us about some of the more advanced features of LUSAS, particularly in terms of analysis? This is a big release for us, version 16. There are plenty of things inside it. You can find, obviously, a lot about that from the LUSAS website at lusas.com. For those of you that are users starting up your uh, program you will see in the readme file a list of everything uh, that is new in this version but just give you a taste of some of the things that are new particularly in terms of more advanced analysis we've revised the interface for creep so time dependency is better handled for creep in concrete we've also put in a new interface for handling temperature dependency of materials the cable tuning has been enhanced as well. It was previously a linear cable tuning function, and that now supports nonlinear geometry and material behavior as well. So we have many things. They're not going to be covered today. This is about making your job quicker, easier, more efficient, reducing errors. Further webinars will cover other content. OK, yes, thanks, Philip. Um, I've got some questions here. Along the lines, what are the different analysis categories? You've got several different 2D categories. What What's the difference there? And sort of along with that, have we actually taken away some options? Um, so first of all, to say uh, absolutely not. It, we're not in the business of taking away your options. Um, but in Lucis version 16, we are in the business of trying to make it easier for you to find the right option. So um, if we can perhaps bring back that PowerPoint slide that Philip had earlier for the analysis categories. Thanks. Yeah, so in the example that we just used, we used that top left-hand category, the 2D grillage or plate uh, category. It's, as you can see, it's illustrated using a grillage here, but we used a plate element um, in the example. And what that really means is we drew in the XY plane and we loaded only in the Z direction. And so our drawing, if you like, our uh, idealization was two-dimensional. And that would be true for any grillage type analysis or plate type analysis until you have in-plane loads. For example, um, if you have an integral bridge, you might have soil pressures and temperature loads occurring in-plane, um, giving in-plane forces, not just bending, but in-plane in forces. And that's when a 3D model would be necessary because you need to take that into account. Moving over to the right, the 2D in-plane, the difference there is that we're drawing, if you like, the elevation, as you can see here, or it could be a section through a tunnel or a section through a box culvert or a, a section through a dam, anything like that, where we're slicing and we're drawing what is essentially an elevation or a section and all the forces are applied in the same plane. So the vertical in this category is in the Y direction, it's downwards on the screen as we look at it now in the elevation. So there's no loads that are going into the page. There, there are only loads in the XY, loads in plane. The 2D axis symmetric, I think, speaks for itself. It's a slice on a circular object like this settlement tank here or LNG tanks, these sorts of things which people use Lucis for. Whereas everything in the real world, of course, is three-dimensional. And so you can always use 3D 
as an option. But this is actually a, a massive deal, in fact, because what it means is that in version 16, as you choose that category up front, um, all the choices downstream are rationalized. So when you're looking at the line mesh attribute, you can't choose um, a, a 3D element if you're working in 2D, and you can't choose a 2D element if you're working in 3D. And likewise, as you will have noticed when I went to things like loading options or, or the support options, um, you're only seeing the choices that you actually have to make if you've ever, I don't know, you've ever got an error message that says something to do with using a three-dimensional beam element together with a two-dimensional geometric attribute, well, you won't get that error ever again now. So that's the sort of thing which, which can really uh, save you a bundle of time. Okay, thanks, Steve, for uh, for covering those. And uh, that completes the practical demonstration of LUSAS 16. Just to reiterate, this is all about speed, efficiency, and a more friendly interface, a better experience for you as a user uh, with this new release. Along with the release of the software, we're releasing additional media content to support that. We now have a new microsite. This can be read on any device. It's what's called a responsive website. So you can view it easily on mobiles, tablets, as well as PCs. There's new content on there that you can view and download. So as I mentioned earlier on, there is a more general video on version 16, which you can look at straight away, which will give you an impression, obviously, of some of the design and collaboration facilities that we did not cover in this event. We've also got um, a coupling now of social media with the, in, uh, with the LUSAS website. So Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn and Instagram are our primary social media forms and those are now displayed inside the LUSAS website so you can see our live content stream there. You can interact with it, like it, comment on it and, and please do, we encourage that sort of interaction. If you need help in using version 16, please rely as ever on our support team headed by Ahad Kalahi. Uh, they can help you obviously with what's new in LUSAS 16 as well as all the general inquiries that you may have on the use of the product. We will be doing other webinar events and the first of those that we intend to do is on comprehensive design within LUSAS. The major facility within which is the new comprehensive steel designer. So look out on your email and on your social media. We'll be making announcements on that presently. But otherwise, it just rests with me to say thank you very much for attending today. Uh, we value your time. We look forward to your feedback on what you think of version 16. And we look forward to welcoming you to future events, either online or in your offices. Thank you.